He used to bring beautiful women here, eat fine meals, drink fine wine, listen to zombie takeout. But it always ended with screaming. What's up? Welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got some listeners submitted. This is a tweet from Bodo. Um, in reference to our last episode, he said, Great job on that horrible Monty Python movie. I'm doing great. Appreciate the shout out. Y'all are the best. He also left us a fairly long voicemail, but I feel the need to play it all. Hey, it's Bodo. Let's try this again. Hey, I'm doing great. And I appreciate the fine work that you guys are doing. And I appreciate the shout out that you did for us truck drivers. I just got to say one thing about this whole situation that's going on. Please be nice to other people. I realize that social distancing is important. But just say thank you. Thank you to the people that are out there that are helping all of us out. Say thank you to the people at the convenience stores, at the restaurants. Just say thank you. Because we're all in this together. I realize this is not like 9-11 where everybody was coming around hugging each other. But still, just say thank you. And you guys keep up the great work that you're doing. You make us laugh. And I appreciate that because we need to laugh more often. Be happy, people. Laugh every day. Find something that makes you smile and makes you feel good. And John and Scotto, you guys make me laugh. And I appreciate you guys very much. So, just be happy. Things will get worse, but we will come together as a family. And I love you guys. Be careful. I will be careful. I will continue to deliver food and make this country a little bit better. And I will continue to smile and hold doors open for people. And regardless of the situation, you guys are the best. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Bodo. That, it is very important. We will uh, we'll try to be funny. <laughs> no, but uh, thanks for... I mean, it's oh, kind the of a Winston point. Churchill thing. <laughs> yeah. No pressure on us, though. Uh-huh. And without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1986, From Beyond. This is our Stuart Gordon tribute. Um, yeah, last week's episode disappeared because at the last minute, I realized that the movie we were going to do was really problematic in a number of ways, and I didn't want to draw attention to it. Fortunately, I caught you before you watched it. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for that. And we ended up, you know, so we just scrapped Zombie Take Out. We, and then after the hearing last week, we started looking for other movies. And we talk a lot about movies being in our wheelhouse, at least internally. I don't know if you say much on the air. Yeah. We couldn't have found something more in our wheelhouse. Well, yeah. And uh, I, I think I could take credit for doing this one because I was determined to look through his yeah, yeah. you know catalog mm-hmm. and it was like the most combs possible yeah, right right yeah and it is from 1986 from beyond this is our Stuart gordon tribute i don't think i mentioned that part nice. and of course that brings us to the impromptu plot summary sponsored by recycled sound effects once you hear it it just keeps getting funnier and also brought to you by the clapper when flipping a switch is just too damn hard uh, 
imagine if they just set the thing up on a clapper, mm-hmm. they could have end of story. But anyway, how the fuck am I going to summarize this? <laughs> I mean, this is seriously. It's pretty some straightforward fever until the last shit. end, or the last act. <laughs> All right, so we have the bad scientist and his assistant. The assistant makes the discovery, and um, he sees those lampreys. Which I mean, I saw what those fuckers did to Christopher Lloyd. Okay, you lampreys. Never turn I was thinking eels, but oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, That's close. Made a nice reference to. Christopher Lloyd getting the lamprey up his ass. But oh, anyway, I totally um, forgot about that movie. <laughs> but anyway, he uh, he pretty much opens the door to another dimension, or actually, he opens something up in his brain where they can see mm-hmm. right uh, this elements. other dimension that's right on top of ours. Yeah, and uh, d- uh, you can't say parallel. I guess you could say an overlaying dimension mm-hmm. or uh, or adjacent dimension. Yeah, uh, you know. But anyway, he uh, so he opens up this part of his brain, both of their brains, and uh, the, the well, pineal the mad, gland specifically. The mad scientist decides to go all the way, and they uh, eat his head. Mm. Eat his head. Well, anyway, he's blamed for murder despite not finding a head, despite there not being blood on the weapon, mm. despite. Uh, you know, a story that he is stuck to several times, apparently, because they said he keeps going back to the same delusion. And it's like, um, well, then it's not varied, then, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and so they're uh, institutionalizing him when along comes this hot shot uh, uh, psychiatrist who, by the way, we got to uh, more on that later when we get to the review on that scene. But um, we... <laughs> Uh, she takes him out and wants to finish his experiment to see what he's seen or recreate his experiment to see what they have seen. And uh, they only bring one police officer with them. And um, despite him being, you know, possible murderous lunatic, <laughs> he's uh, he's got free will and they're just hanging about in the house. And uh, they conduct the experiment they get the same results. Only problem is now her brain hmm. has been twisted or enlarged or whatever you want to call it. And uh, she can't leave or does not want to leave. And uh, everybody else wants to get the fuck out. But they, they the door keeps opening or the, the frequency keeps uh, opening up. And fortunately, only the people in the house could be affected by it. Because nobody outside, I mean, that would have been crazy. It was the rest coming of the, from inside the house. Yeah, if the rest of the world it just went out. Hmm. And um, and then the, the dead scientist who was brought over to the other side figures out a way to open the portal from that side. Right, he comes back. Uh, well, I guess it's just his brain hmm. lopped in with this other creature that took him. And... Uh, the, kills the cop, almost kills uh, Crawford, the, the, the assistant, mm. and uh, almost kills the, the psychiatrist too, or psychologist. I can't remember. I think psychiatrist. Probably. And um, and of course, they're both going to be institutionalized when uh, too much damage has been done to the assistant, and uh, he starts to go on a bit of a rampage. In the uh, in the nut hut himself, and um, they they wind up both escaping uh, on their own for different purposes, of course. One uh, to go back to the house, I think the other to chase after her. Yeah, I think so. Or he just went back to yeah. He was chasing her, yeah, because he was just trying to eat everybody at that point. Yeah, and uh, they go back to, of course, the scene of the crime again. And uh, this time they, um, well, I guess uh, I guess you could say hilarity ensues at this point, and right? Bad they, shit insanity ensues. <laughs> yes, that shit insanity ensues. And Oof. this machine, the resonator that they use to, uh, you know, connect to this other dimension, it was a plasma ball and a bunch of tuning, big tuning forks. Yes, I love well, being sci-fi. Why? Why would? 
you need a tuning how do you make a tuning fork that size well no they do make them that size you, you know you you need them to tune various you know instruments of different pitches they do okay. make them that size they do mm-hmm. yeah so they're well, very then, large tuning forks then the prop department really didn't do a whole lot there no. they just set up they, large they just screwed together a bunch of random shit from the hardware store a plasma ball uh, some big tuning forks and you know random computer looking things now when you say plasma ball is that the one that you touch your hand yes. on and you see the uh, electra mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> it makes your hair stand up yeah okay that's pretty much that's what, what it i was. thought yeah and the, there's a trope in this movie fortunately they don't do too much with it but i'm so glad it's gone the nosy neighbor <laughs> They, yeah, it really was just in the intro. And, and a little bit at the end, but yeah, it, I just re- I totally forgot about that trope until now, and I realized I don't miss it in the slightest. It really didn't make any sense because, I, I mean, well, first the cops ignore her, but then it's like she goes in. Yeah, she goes into the house just when all the, everything's hitting the fan. And within the first seven minutes... The movie doesn't waste any time. Within the first seven minutes, we have both Combs and the neighbor running for their lives. Combs is arrested, and we have a headless corpse before the opening credits. Right. And the credits remind me a lot of Psycho. Hmm. Um, yeah, I guess with the, the crazy, yeah, the font. I should mention this is loosely based on a story of the same name by Lovecraft. Wait, you mean Lovecraft didn't write about computers? Hmm. <laughs> And Gordon had previously worked with both Combs and Crampton on Reanimator, also based on Lovecraft. Um, he cast him in, in part because he had become used to working with a company of actors during his time in theater and felt that doing the same thing with Lovecraft movies would allow the actors to know coming into the shoot what would be asked, asked of them. Um, and he, apparently they were asked to do all sorts of odd things and, and you know <laughs> they'd be able to handle it better. And you could see they... Uh... They really did shine in this, both of them, honestly. Oh, yeah. Crampton and, and, and Combs. Mm-hmm. They're just absolutely wonderful in this. Everybody else, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I could have lived without, probably. But Crampton and Combs, goddamn, they were good. Well, there's only one actor, who, one other actor who has a significant part. Right. The cop. Um, everybody else is in oh. it for like a scene or two. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about uh, Pretorius. Uh... Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. He has a fairly significant part, too. And, and you know, both of them are, eh, they're, they're all right, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Pretorius, Preter, Pretorius is sort of the, the classic mad doctor. Yeah. He doesn't really do a whole lot with the, uh, with the role, I, you know. It's a lot of the prosthetics doing the acting. Yeah. Now, I have to call out the sound effect. (laughs) In the asylum scene, um, there is a sound effect that you hear when the doors open and close that was used in in Star Trek TOS. Right. It is that classic door sound effect. It it made me chuckle. I didn't really, I didn't even put it in my notes. I just remember it. I'm just kind of like, oh, that's funny. Um, I had to listen to it like five. That watched that scene like five times just to keep hearing it. It just kept getting funnier to me. Now, the that scene though, the that that entrance of the to the asylum. Mm. Holy shit! Does that remind you of another movie that came after this? What's specific? No, I wasn't thinking about that. Shot for shot, almost. That is a recre, where it was recreated in the movie Silence of the Lambs. Oh, it's been too long since I've seen Silence of the Lambs. Right down to the inmate jerking off. Okay, wow. Because I was going to in that movie, you know, he threw like jizz. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to call this movie out for being a bit problematic in terms of its depictions of the mentally ill. Which is a very 80s thing, you know. It was yeah. common at the time. Um, but I, and I guess Silence of the Lambs was 80s, too. Right. It was like... Well, the book was, I think, two years after this movie. Okay. And then the movie was a few years after the book. But that scene, I, I would love to see them side by side. Mm-hmm. And, and think about it. Think about what that scene in Silence of the Lambs was. It was the the um, criminal psychiatrist 
psychologists mm. coming into the asylum and being, you know, passing the inmates to work with one of the inmates on a case. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like the, the exact same thing. Mm. It's really fucked up that the two, and her peeking into each, you know, into each cell to see each inmate. Huh. And it was two years difference between this and the book. Yes. So this was before the book. Yeah, but a, two years is a little slim to be of influence the book. Well, I don't yeah, know I don't, how fast it was written, but and of course I don't know about like if that scene was even in the book. Well, but that's the true. The movie, of the, course, the movie was like very probably five years after off. this. Yes, that's true. Yes, Debbie totally ripped this off, uh-huh. or, or was paying homage to it. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. Um, <laughs> now another thing I got to call out. Um, Combs throws around throws around the word theory. He's a physicist. <laughs> he knows the proper scientific definition. There are two definitions of theory. The colloquial definition, which is how we all use it, is, is you know, I have a, an idea, a hypothesis in the right. scientific terms. And then right. there's theory in the scientific sense, which is something that connects a, a number of um, observations, makes sense right. of them. Um, he was using it in the colloquial sense, a scientist in the colloquial sense, in in kind of a scientific concept context, <sighs> just annoyed me. Um, I mean, I don't know if we can really expect them to be, uh, I don't know, familiar with. Sci- Although he does do a lot of scientific movies, so you would think, yeah, with Reanimator and this, that they would really study the lingo a little mm-hmm. better. It was the 80s. You know, I, I'm talking a lot of... It, it was the 80s. Um, now, shortly after that, when they leave the asylum and decide, you know, he's going to go with them and try to fix, try to solve this case, there's a shot of Car- Crawford, Catherine, the shrink, and the cop, whose name I'm blanking on, um, in the van, from you know, through the windshield. They were like some sort of demented Scooby gang. <laughs> And then later, when you see her leaving in the van from the hospital, it is actually the Scooby van. I didn't notice, really. It looks just like the Scooby van. I mean, I have uh, my notes when they were approaching the house. Oh, come on. 666 is the house number. N-word, please. It was? <laughs> yes, it was. Oh, man. <laughs> now, I, I have to say, I was impressed with the BDSM porn clip. There is a clip of BDSM porn in the movie. Um, apparently, Pretori- Pre- I'm going to keep mis- mispronouncing his name. Pretorius was into that. Um, and so he filmed I keep himself. I call him Pastorius, like in Jocko. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they show a, f- a, a significant clip of, of his um, activities in the movie. Um, do you have to call it out? Again, this is an 80s thing, but it is very puritanical, the movie. Yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, I mean, I'm not going to complain about seeing Barbara Crampton in, in leather. Um, the movie <laughs> seemed to have an issue with it. And on that topic, I, I just need to nitpick. Um, the pineal gland, it does have an effect on sex characteristics, not on sex drive, from my research. Hmm. Um, again, it's, it's yeah, how much can you nitpick a <laughs> cheesy 80s horror film, but. And as soon as she leaves, you know, she wants to turn the, the re- resonator back on the next day after you know, they have that initial incident. Right. I she's... knew she was possessed. Right. She, she was addicted. Yeah. I was addicted or maybe just possessed by Pretorius or whatever got him. Uh, but such... Oh, man, you got to call out Combs again. Um, the fact that he could take a line... That's as simple as that will be quite enough of that. Yeah. And actually, I mean, make it into something. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a well-written line. No, it's it's a fairly cliche line. It's it's a throwaway line. Yeah. In the hands of Combs, though, Mm -hmm. it's fucking hilarious. And they turn this, they decide to turn it back on. She convinces them. And they see the evil Pretarius in this sort of grotesque, still fairly human-looking body. 
and he says, go ahead and touch me. And he's standing there in this sort of grotesque body, naked and covered in goo. And Crawford actually touches him. <laughs> well, that's my learned, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I've told you once, I've told you twice, don't touch the Lochnar. <laughs> Uh, but I love there's like direct contradictions and dialogue to actual to to movement, which is really funny. And then it happens throughout this movie. But he's like tells everyone, don't move, flips the switch. And mm-hmm. of course, he moves. He walks away from the switch. Yeah. <laughs> it just it happens throughout. You're just kind of like, wait, did he just say? <laughs> mm hmm. He just they're 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 of their own mind. They're just kind of ignoring the script. It feels it's just going yeah. off on their own. Mm-hmm. Well, he, I mean, Gordon had a theater background, so there may have been a lot of improvisation. Yeah, I have to say, I have to give him a look some credit for being creative with Pretorius, the monster version. You know, he got it was very the thing. Starts oh, off kind of vaguely humanoid, and then just turns into this weirdly shaped monster. I think South Park took a lot or, or did a lot from this uh, something with like the blobby monster. Mm-hmm. And even uh, when Bubba gets uh, destroyed, I think they re- reenacted a few of these things. Huh. Yeah, I, this is a movie they would totally borrow from. I can easily yeah. see that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Some weird things, though. Like, aren't they really just two at home for a, at a murder scene though yeah yeah they, they kind of you know i'm almost said shack up but they they do end up staying at the house for a while after they've come back to it and yeah a guy was killed there and there's this you know demonic portal in the basement right they're treating this criminal investigation like it's a, a sleepover mm-hmm <laughs> And we'll go make some eggs. <laughs> like, the last act of the movie gets very Black Rainbow. Beyond the Black Rainbow. Um, at one point, Combs is sort of eaten by a monster. Or, or is partially, you know, it starts to eat him. The cop pulls him out. He's bald. All right. <laughs> really, uh, yeah, he's bald. And I guess it was to have the prosthetic... Uh... Mm-hmm. To show the... the, the pulsing head and the, the eye coming out wait and, or was the that a third eye on his head or was he just happy to see me they do get very phallic with the, with the pineal, <laughs> grow, growing pineal gland i guess it is i don't know it's an eye stalk that comes out oh it was a stalk huh and yeah that's when you know um um barbara cramps and catherine um starts you know puts on this leather outfit um one that you know uh, pretarius had for his, his women um and and uh, in an interview in sixteen, uh, in 2016, Barbara Crampton uh, was asked if her 13-year-old daughter and 14-year-old son had seen From Beyond and her other early films. She said, no, but my son's friends have seen all my stuff on the internet. And they're like, dude, your mom's naked in black leather. And my son's <laughs> like, mom, you should have told me before I, my friend saw it. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Okay. And then I showed my son everything. Direct <laughs> quote. Apparently, she sold that outfit at a uh, fleet, uh, yard sale. Really? Wait, sold it or bought it? Sold it. Sold it. Hmm. But the transformation Combs makes is absolutely brilliant. Oh, yeah. He's sort of this nebbish, you know, assistant to a scientist who just turns into this monster. But also, like, periodically comes back from it and is Crawford again. Well, yeah, he has his moments and he like, what have I done? Kind of this Jekyll and Hyde thing he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It gets really weird towards the end, though, when... Uh, you really know, like, weird. That's, that's an understatement. Like, like when Crawford taunts uh, Pistorius... Um, like about trying to you know using emasculation and mm-hmm. stuff it was like where's this coming from even like well, that they was have the um puritana- puritanical side you know the anti-bdsm stuff i don't know was it or, or was it i mean uh, he was also just trying to, to draw his attention draw him away 
but that's the avenue he took was to take a shot at him because he's a dom and he, you know it's he, he's basically calling him impotent you know hmm. you can't make a lot of all this stuff it was the fight between them was short but it was epic <laughs> And just you know the 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 lampreys encircling Catherine, and the end of the movie just gets insane. Yeah, Crawford at one point tries to climb out of Pretorius. <laughs> yeah, that whole that was some very disturbing uh, claymation. Like a lot of the the effects are just kind of like, oh, that, why did you guys even try to do that? But that at the end, that mm-hmm. that whole climactic melting yeah. eating thing was just whoa <laughs> That's and I mentioned up. Black Rainbow um, and, and for those who don't know Black Rain- Beyond the Black Rainbow is a movie we reviewed in 2012 creepiest movie I've ever seen it haunts me to this day read it a five haven't seen it since though <laughs> likewise I think maybe a four and a half on my part for me um I'm like, I don't even know if I like this. <laughs> but, but it was it, brilliantly made. But Damn. <laughs> it haunts me to this day. The similarities between this, from Beyond and Black Rainbow, had me creeped out after watching the movie. I was creeped out more after watching it than I was while watching it. Well, and as soon as you brought it up like, before we started tonight, I was like, oh yeah, obviously, Com- Combs, when he doesn't have his hair, is just like the guy mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. beyond black rainbow maybe that was it but there were certain other parts too that, that yeah just mirrored black rainbow for me although the most disturbing effect in the film was after Catherine jumps out the window her the bone sticking out of her knee that was damn good too yeah that it, was incredibly well done it's weird how they did their best effects for the very end mm-hmm. and i have to ask did you cringe when she bit off the pineal gland? <laughs> a, a little, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I should point out, according to Gordon, securing an R rating from the MPAA was a challenging ordeal. He quotes <laughs> him as saying his, pre- his presented cut of the film had ten times too much of everything. He was ultimately able to get away with making small trims and w- without removing any entire sequences from the film. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Ten times too much of everything. One last bit of trivia. The resonator sound was later sampled by the Beastie Boys for Intergalactic. Oh, okay. Yeah, I could see that. Now, a sort of sequels and remakes. Gordon Combs and Crampton would work together on a third Lovecraft adaptation in 95, the direct-to-video Castle Freak. And Gordon would later direct versions of two more Lovecraft works, um, the film D- Dagon in 2001, and the second episode of the Investors of Horror television series H.P. Lovecraft's Dreams in the Witch House in 2005. I'm curious to see um, uh, Castle Freak, but it's direct a video. Yeah. So I don't know. On the brains? On the brains. I was really on the fence about whether to recommend this one until that last, like, maybe 10 minutes where it just (laughs) went in completely insane. That made it recommendable, I'm going for. Yeah, I'm for as well. Um, Some of the the logic to the story doesn't make much sense, and some of the acting's a bit shaky, but god damn, it's worth watching Combs and Crampton together, Mm. and, uh, and the ending is just fucking bananas. Yeah. All right, so what have we learned? Well, uh, that a football player wouldn't wear his uh, a jersey, in, his own jersey, unless it was a promotional event. But uh, really, of course, I learned when a naked man asks you to touch him, don't. <laughs> and I learned that plasma balls and some tuning forks are all you need to see into another dimension. I mean, I've got a few of the tuning forks already. I just need to get the plasma ball. <laughs> All right, that's it for From Beyond. Until next time when we'll be reviewing Heavy Metal 2000, our Julie Strange tribute. Always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.